Welcome back to the Long Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. We are now in a mid-morning break in the Gary King, Michael Smith, and Laquan Barrow case out of Florida. And I want to dissect everything that's happened today and what's been happening in the last few days. And to help me talk a little bit more about this, I'm joined by our second prosecutor of the day, uh, Kendall Coffey. Kendall, great to see you. Hey, thanks for including me today. Kendall, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on today. Um, so we see the prosecution is making out a pretty strong case, I would say, against Mr. Barrow. Maybe Mr. Smith, but not really Mr. King. Do you see the same kind of thing? Very, very much so. It was a pretty good morning for Mr. King, uh, just in the sense that several times, uh, the jury now really has heard that he, defendant King, attempted to be a peacemaker. When you couple that with the fact that <clears throat> the other testimony up to now against King has not exactly been overwhelming, uh, you know, things are looking okay for him right now. Obviously, as you pointed out, very, very, very different situation. Here we had a very, very clear eyewitness identification that Barrow had a gun and was shooting. Yeah, we have seven witnesses who've te testified so far that they saw Laquan Barrow shooting into the crowd. Three others saw him in the club or parking lot before the shooting, basically showing that he was trying to get a gun. We have five witnesses said that they saw Gary King at the nightclub, but only one has seen him with a firearm, and that was one of the victims in this case who originally said, I'm talking about Nate or Munch, Nathaniel Kendrick, he was the one who actually initially told police that Smith and King were not the shooters, but Barrow was. And now when he testified, he said that all three were the shooters. And we keep kind of seeing this, this difference between what was told to police and what they're testifying to now. People that were involved in the altercation seem to be pointing more towards these defendants than they initially told police. What do you make of that? Well, it's, uh, it's something that's going to be very clear to the jury that they have to look somewhat skeptically to this extent that there's a single witness that the state is relying on because all uh, most of the witnesses have some inconsistencies so with respect to king if the best the state has at this point is one witness who was apparently contradictory and that that may not get it done for the state and of course as we also know this has been described as chaotic it's hard for me to think that the jury is going to find beyond into the reasonable doubt anything in this scenario that rests entirely on the on the strength of a single witness. And at the same time, as, as we know, this is not a case where the jury is getting to see the forensics that they get used to seeing on television and reading about in some cases. We don't have that kind of conclusive DNA or, or other evidence. So there's a lot of questions. But when the jury starts to add it up and when they put the pieces together, you got multiple witnesses that can, for example, put a gun in the hands of a barrel. And if you have multiple witnesses that can put a gun in the hand of Smith, that's something that, that could go a long way. Now, Kendall, you're a prosecutor. Explain this to me for a little bit. I get the second degree murder charge uh, in connection with Benicia Robinson, Benicia Robinson. She was just a girl at the club in the caught in crossfire. Why were they not charged with attempted first degree murder in the sense of, uh, especially towards the Kendricks? For, because based upon the story that I keep hearing, um, and what our viewers are hearing, what the jury is hearing, is that Mr. Barrow and maybe Mr. Smith went back to the parking lot to retrieve guns uh, because there was this altercation with the Kendricks and they went back to shoot them. Why not go for that attempted first degree murder charge? Well, I think you had enough to charge first degree murder, at least with respect to Barrow, because there were comments being attributed to his showing that somebody was going to get kill, killed that, that fateful night. Uh, <clears throat> very often, there was a strategic decision made to avoid overcharging simply because there's inconclusive evidence. They want to try them together. They weren't sure enough. But I I can tell you there are prosecutors who would have charged us, at least with respect to Barrow, as a first-degree murder case. Yeah, it's interesting to see how it plays out. And one of the other interesting highlights of this case is that, yes, they're all being tried together, but they're two separate juries. So Mr. King has his own separate jury. And I have to tell you, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him being acquitted and maybe Mr. Barrow and Mr. Smith being found guilty. Do you think that might be a possibility? I think it's a real possibility so far. We haven't seen the defense case. We haven't seen all the prosecution cases. Like the jurors themselves 
we kind of want to wait till, till the end till we crystallize significant impressions. But based on what we've seen so far, Barrel is in a pretty uphill position. Uh, as you pointed out at the beginning of our, our discussion, King looks like he could be heading toward an acquittal. And it's kind of a, a mixed situation with respect to Smith. So uh, his, his case is, is too close to call right, right now. But as we know, under Florida's law, if it's an attempted murder, even if, uh, for example, Smith is, is charged with something less than the murder itself, and can, I'm sorry, convicted for something less than the murder itself, if the jury finds that he had a gun in his hand and that he discharged that gun, then he is facing a very severe minimum mandatory in terms of time in prison. Yeah, it's interesting when the questions uh, is not have you seen my client uh, with uh, with a gun or not even that just have you seen them shoot a gun or even did they have a gun in their possession because I think that's a really interesting point for the jury to hear and the point from what I've heard so far is that no one even really saw except for one witness no one's really even see, seen King holding a gun let alone firing one um, it, what's interesting also about this case is the fact that um, you, you have the victims who are testifying here and we saw Nathaniel Kendrick who's been intimately involved in what happened here and the fact that he initially said Barrow and now he's linking up uh, King and Smith how much is it in your opinion uh, when you when this case is brought to the media attention and certain defendants are brought to trial how much is it for the danger of a witness who starts maybe embellishing certain facts knowing that the three defendants are on the stand now now that they've been identified how much do they start creating in their minds and remember this is two years ago maybe they start filling in those gaps with new information because now they're trying to already point the blame at the defendants I think it happens commonly and especially when a case is in the media especially when it's getting talked about uh, throughout perhaps the neighborhood and in the community especially when you've got uh, friends who are talking about it hearing about it too so that's a, a significant risk, and I think the defense is going to argue very strongly the, uh, the difference between the original police interviews, where presumably the, me uh, the memories, the impressions were the freshest and the least tainted by other information. They're going to argue very strongly about that, and that's going to plant some serious issues in the minds of jurors. We keep talking about what Barrow is going to, what the Barrow defense team is going to do here. And we heard in the beginning of the opening statements um, from Mr. Gorley, who's his attorney, that there's this other individual, Kira Scott. Mr. Scott was with Mr. Barrow during this time and apparently is going to testify to the fact that he tried to keep Barrow away, um, that Barrow was the one who was, um, uh, he was the one who, when the gunfire broke up, who was undercover, that he had nothing to do with this. But you keep hearing these witnesses who didn't see Mr. Scott, or they didn't see anybody matching Mr. Scott's description. Is that one witness going to be enough for the defense to convince jurors here? I, I think the, uh, the witness is, is going to be pretty badly outnumbered. But uh, as you know, uh, jur jurors can convict based on the strength of a single witness. They find the witness credible enough, and they can certainly find a reasonable doubt if that witness uh, is, is, uh, is effective. Meanwhile, looking at the, the, the uh, I'll call him the bouncer today, meaning no disrespect to security uh, personnel, uh, he wasn't a perfect witness, but by and large, I think uh, he got a couple of things across pretty well. I, I think the jury listening to him and, you know, watching, as you pointed out, sort of the, uh, some of the matching uh, or, or some of the corroborating testimony by the detective is going to think that he was mostly being uh, truthful, maybe a few glitches here and there, but uh, he didn't testify in a way that I thought was overly scripted. There were things he didn't know, things he, he kind of like what wasn't completely sure about. One thing that I think he was very convincing on, and I didn't see the defense try to detract from this, is that security guards were not there firing guns. So mm -hmm. I think to the extent that the, de the defense, especially Barrow's counsel, might have tried to present a theory that maybe, you know, security guards uh, were, uh, were, were firing too. I, I think that that kind of alternative hypothesis uh, of, in of innocence is, is pretty much uh, erased at this point. So uh, what it's going to come down to is, is a tragic murder. Some people shot up badly. I don't think a jury is going to want to say 
no one is guilty here. So if this case is, is aiming toward a, uh, a conviction of second degree murder, then I, I think Barrow's got a lot to be concerned about. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, one of the great things about here on the Long Crime Network, as we videotape this, uh, as we live stream the trials, we get to see the defendants reacting to certain testimony. And I think one of the people in this case who's the most interesting to watch, it might be Defendant Smith, Michael Smith. Now, he was wearing a bright red shirt today. He makes kind of um, uh, certain smirks during certain testimony. I have to ask, I have to ask, he chose to wear a very bright colored shirt in the courtroom with a very loud tie. Now, I, what does that signal to you? That's, is that a strategic move? He really is standing out there. Is that a strategic move you think on the part of his defense counsel? Well, I mean, I hope it was consistent with defense strategy because it wouldn't be part of my plan to have have the client dress in any way that, that's, that's eye-catching. You sort of want people to look like uh, they're as serious uh, as possible, uh, dress conservatively, and you tell clients that the jury is watching you a lot, uh, your face gestures, your reactions. And you try to encourage clients to, to dress and look and conduct themselves in a way that assumes they are under a microscope every minute that that jury is is in the courtroom. So things like smirks, things like colorful clothes, not anything that's in uh, criminal defense law 101, but I, I'm going to assume that uh, they, they have a reason to want to get some attention to their client, either that or their client. Uh, is just going to wear what he's going to wear, no matter what the defense lawyers tell him. Yeah, I, you know, I, they're each each one of them is reacting a little bit differently to the testimony. Mr. Barrow looks very concerned, very serious when each one is testifying. Some might even have said, and they even said in our message boards, he looks guilty. Um, Mr. King looks hopeful, I would say, and then I think Mr. Smith is just a little entertaining to watch right now. But the, when there really was interesting is when one witness testified yesterday, uh, Ebony Humans. Now, she was good friends of D.D. Kendrick. I want to play some of her testimony from yesterday, and then, Kendall, I'd like to get your thoughts uh, if we have time before we go to the live feed. So now I do want to play the testimony of one of the key witnesses from yesterday, Ebony Humans, and you will be the decision maker about whether or not she, you believe that she is a credible witness. Take a look. Spell for the court reporter, please. Ebony, E-B-O-N-Y, last name Yeomans, Y-O-U-M-A-N-S. And Ms. Yeomans, are you currently employed? Yes, ma'am. And where are you employed? At Avanti. What is that? It's a nursing and rehab. Okay. How long have you been there? Um, a few months. Okay. Do you live in Ocala, Marion County? Yes, ma'am. Have you, how long have you lived here in Marion County? All my life. Do you know a person by the name of Danielle Kendrick? Yes, ma'am. Um, describe your relationship with Danielle. That's my best friend. Okay. What do you call her? Danielle. Does she have a nickname? <laughs> Dee Dee? Okay. Do you know Nathaniel Kendrick? Yes, ma'am. And who is Nathaniel Kendrick to you? That's my best friend's brother. Okay. Did you previously have a dating relationship with him? Yes, ma'am. When? A few years ago. Do you know a person by the name of Maisha Barrow? I have heard of her name, but don't know her personally. Okay. Have you seen her around town before? I have. On multiple occasions? Yes, ma'am. Do you know a person by the name of Laquan Barrow or Quan? Don't know him personally. Okay. Have you seen him before? I have. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you please point to him and identify something that he's wearing? White shirt, blue tie. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Laquan Barrow. The record will so reflect. Do you know somebody by the name of Gary King? I've heard of him. Okay. Have you seen him before? Yes, ma'am. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Black shirt. Okay. Black shirt. What kind of tie is he wearing? Black and white tie. Regular tie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Gary King. The record will so reflect. Do you know somebody by the name of Michael Eugene Smith? I've heard of him. Have you seen him before? Once. Once? The night of the Cloud Nine shooting? Yes, ma'am. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe something he's wearing? Black shirt, tail tie. Okay. Bow tie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Michael Smith. The record will Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We do have a live feed right now in this case out of Florida. So I want to show a side by side view of what we see right now. It appears to be a sidebar right now with the judge in this case. Um, I'm here today joined by our second prosecutor of the day, Kendall Coffey. Uh, Kendall, I want, I'm curious about the idea when you have three defense attorneys here. How do they try to work together when each one of their clients is saying they had nothing to do with it? And let's not forget, let's not forget, we know that it's possible three guns were used in this shooting. We hear witnesses saying that they heard gunshots from at least two guns, maybe three. And we know that yesterday, or the, excuse me, the first day, that it was identified that three separate weapons or three separate uh, shell casings were found from three separate guns. So the idea that it was three different defendants and not these gentlemen, how are they working together uh, for a united front? Well, that's a great question because defense lawyers, as part of the culture, part of the tradition, try to cooperate with co-defendants because, of course, you've got the vast resources of the state, in the case of a federal case, the United States government, and, and the def defense lawyers know that they've got to try to cooperate as much as they can against the, the common a adversary because of all of the, uh, the advantages that the prosecution has. The problem is you get into trial, and depending upon the nature of the charges, sometimes you got to go your own way. And this is a classic example of this. If you're king, you definitely want to separate as much as you can from Barrow. And in fact, you kind of, if you're looking out for your client, you're sort of hoping that the jury decides it, that Barrow was the bad guy who's responsible for everything and king is the good guy. But as a matter of professionalism, as a matter of trying to keep a cooperative uh, liaison at the same time you got to battle like crazy for your own client they try to avoid piling on so for example so for example uh king's king's lawyer got up there and you know wants to say now you you didn't see uh king with a gun or anything like that they've got to create a distance but what they don't say they don't try to reinforce the prosecution's message usually to the detriment of a co-defendant you didn't see King's lawyer or, or Smith's lawyer go on and on and on and say, it was Barrow, wasn't it? Yeah, and Barrow uh, made the comments, right? And Barrow, it was Barrow that, that you believe fired at least two shots, maybe more. So what they try to do is separate themselves without piling on the co-defendant to the extent that they can. Yeah, Kendall, good analysis. Uh, we actually do have a live feed in the courtroom, so let's go to it now. Ready? Okay. Are we ready for the jury? Yes, sir. I would, when Mr. Shaw is cross examined, if I could just ask that prior to counsel discussing things you may have said on prior occasions, the proper predicate be laid for impeachment. Just so, uh, asking him what he said before. If you object, I'll rule on your objection. To return the juries, please. Call your next witness.
swear or form that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Sophie God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just to record. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Well, can you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for the court reporter? My name is Jarrell Shaw. J-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Last name is Shaw. S-H-A-W. Mr. Shaw, in 2015, did you live in the Ocala area? Yes, sir. When did you move to Ocala? I uh, moved to Ocala maybe 2013, 14. Did you grow up somewhere else? I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Why'd you come to Ocala? I came to Ocala for a slower pace of life, a slower pace of living, and it's more affordable up here also. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. Unfortunately, we're not uh, allowed to show this witness or provide audio for him. So uh, as soon as that testimony is done, we will go back to the courtroom and hopefully we'll explain to you what you may have missed. Apologize for that, but that is just the rule that we have to go by today. Um, so, but not a big deal because we do have a lot of testimony to talk about and a lot of analysis to dissect in this case. And joining me again is our prosecutor, our second prosecutor of the day, Kendall Coffey. Kendall, um, I want to just talk about before we went into the break um, a little bit about some of the aspects of this case that we might have missed. Um, the, the prosecution right now is going to have, I think they might rest their case today. What else do they need to put forward um, that they might not have done so far that you might not have seen so far? Well, I mean, I think they <clears throat> put as many witnesses as they can. Um, I don't know, and I think they'll get to this in closing, if they've explained some of the inconsistencies, because uh, as, as we've seen, there were witnesses, including some significant elements of testimony, which changed from the time of the original police interview, where presumably the witness had the most recent recollection of things, was not anyone who had been tainted by watching media coverage, talking to friends and things like that. And then you get to the time of trial and there's some changes. In fact, there's some enhancements that are that are added to the testimony. Prosecution um, has has taken some some lumps in that area. And I think we'll we'll hear that in closing, they'll, they'll try to repair that. But but that's a couple uh, uh, a couple breaks in, in, in the in the fence that they've got. The other thing, and they, they tried to explain this as the best as they could, is there's, uh, by modern standards of uh, firearm hom homicide cases, not a lot of forensic backup for the prosecution's position. And I think that's something that the defense is also going to hammer on. Certainly the prosecution in the state's case attempted to, to explain that. But I think nowadays jury ex expectations are pretty high. I mean, I think... A lot of jurors think if you've got half of a fragment of a hair, you can uh, identify a person by name, who their parents are, what suit they are wearing. I mean, they're extravagant expectations, but sometimes the expectations are, are, are somewhat realistic. So that, that's another area that the prosecution is going to have to come back to and the defense is certainly going to talk about in closing. Yeah, this isn't uh, CSI as much as sometimes we want it to be. No. I, I, you know, we keep separating Mr. King from Barrow and Smith, and I think rightfully so because um, the, we, the evidence that the jury has been able to see hasn't been so strong against Mr. King, so it will be interesting to see how the prosecution flavors that in their closing arguments. Um, Mr. King actually requested a speedy trial. That's one of the reasons why he, we have two separate juries and the timing of it worked. Why do you think his, he requested a speedy trial? Exactly because he knew that he had the strongest case and he, he was the one that wanted to get in there both in front of the judge and everyone else and say, I'm innocent. I want to clear my name. And procedurally, sometimes you actually stay in a better position uh, doing that because uh, of speedy trial requests from people who think there's a, a weak prosecution case assume that let's let's go with what we've got i think i've got a fair shot at an, at an at an acquittal tomorrow and then there's always the risk that if the other defendants eventually plead guilty they may turn on them and they may say for example if, if barrow is uh convinced that he's got to make some kind of plea deal he, he may turn on king sometimes you just want to get to trial and try to get your acquittal 
Yeah, it would have been interesting if all three were going out at each other. What ca the defense team for uh, Barrow was saying Smith did it. Smith was saying King did it. King was saying it would have been interesting to see that, but they didn't need to do that. Um, I do want to play, because we didn't get a chance to fully show it, the testimony of Ebony Humans from yesterday. Again, Danielle Kendrick's really good friend was in the club that night, saw this whole altercation, and then the question becomes her credibility, which really was attacked properly by the defense attorneys. I want to play her testimony for you now. For the court reporter, please. Ebony E B O N Y, last name Yeomans, Y O U M A N S. And Miss Yeomans, are you currently employed? Yes, ma'am. And where are you employed? At Avanti. What is that? It's a nursing and rehab. Okay. How long have you been there? Um, a few months. Okay. Do you live in Ocala, Marion County? Yes, ma'am. Have you? How long have you lived here in Marion County? All my life. Do you uh, know a person by the name of Danielle Kendrick? Yes, ma'am. Um, describe your relationship with Danielle. That's my best friend. Okay. What do you call her? Nathaniel. Does she have a nickname? <laughs> Dee Dee? Okay. Do you know Nathaniel Kendrick? Yes, ma'am. And who is Nathaniel Kendrick to you? That's my best friend's brother. Okay. Did you previously have a dating relationship with him? Yes, ma'am. When? A few years ago. Do you know a person by the name of Maisha Barrow? I have heard of her name, but don't know her personally. Okay. Have you seen her around town before? I have. On multiple occasions? Yes, ma'am. Do you know a person by the name of Laquan Barrow or Quan? Don't know him personally. Okay. Have you seen him before? I have. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you please point to him and identify something that he's wearing? White shirt, blue tie. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Laquan Barrow. The record will so reflect. Do you know somebody by the name of Gary King? I've heard of him. Okay. Have you seen him before? Yes, ma'am. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Black shirt. Okay. Black shirt. What kind of tie is he wearing? Black and white tie. Regular tie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Gary King. The record will so reflect. Do you know somebody by the name of Michael Eugene Smith? I've heard of him. Have you seen him before? Once. Once? The night of the Cloud Nine shooting? Yes, ma'am. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you describe something he's wearing? Black shirt, tail tie. Okay. Bow tie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Michael Smith. The record will so reflect. Did you go to Cloud Nine Club on September 12th, going into the morning of September 13th of 2015? Yes, ma'am. Where were you before you went to the club? To my mom's. <laughs> Who else was there with you? A bunch of family, because my niece's head came down. Okay. And um, eventually, uh, some of you went to the club that night? Yes, ma'am. Who went with you? Um, Danielle and one of, I believe, one of my other nieces. Okay, so three of you went together in one car? I met Danielle in town. Okay. Did you arrive together with, with Dee Dee? Yes, ma'am. Where did you park? I can't quite remember. Okay. Do you know approximately what time you got there? Mm, it was after 11. And were you able to get in the club when you got there? Yes, ma'am. How crowded was it when you arrived? Not so crowded. So you go inside, and what do you do? Just stand around. Okay. Eventually, does a fight break out inside the club? Yes, ma'am. Did How close were you to this altercation? I'm probably like where I'm sitting to where you're standing. Okay. So would you say... 15, 20 feet? Yes, ma'am. Did you see who was involved in this fight? Yes, ma'am. Who? The girl they called Maisha and LeBron. Okay. And who else? It was a bunch of people around, so. Okay. Who was, was Maisha fighting? Yes, ma'am. Who was she fighting? Danielle. And you said Quan became involved in it as well? Yes, ma'am. Did that get broken up? Eventually. How? By security. Okay. 
What happened with that group that was involved in the fight? They put them outside. Did you end up outside as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Describe to the jury what happened once the group and yourself was outside the club. Um, it was a security guard was out there, and I was pretty much like, can you just make them leave so we can go to, like, suppress the situation so nothing further would happen? And it was just a bunch of commotion going on outside. Did a fight start up outside the club as well? Yes, ma'am. Between who? Danielle and Maisha. Okay, so it started up again after they were outside. Yes, ma'am. Did Laquan become involved in that as well? I can't quite remember. Did you see Nate at any time inside the club? Once. <clears throat> when, when you saw him inside the club, what was going on? Nothing just passed him. Okay. Did you see him outside the club? Um, eventually. Okay. At the point in time that we were just talking about when Maisha and Danielle started fighting again, he was not outside? What was Laquan doing when his sister and Danielle started fighting again outside the club? He was trying to get closer to the fight. Did he get close to the fight? Not to get involved. Did you hear him say anything at this point in time? Yes, ma'am. What did you hear him say? He said he gonna wet a bitch. What does that mean to you? To me, that means he's gonna shoot somebody. Okay. And when you say wet, you're saying W-E-T? Yes, wet. After he said that, what did he do? He was just pacing back and forth in the parking lot. Okay. Where was all this going on in relation to the front door of the club? Like, right in the front. Okay. Like, as soon as you get out of the door. Do you remember what Laquan was wearing that night? Yes, ma'am. What was he wearing? He originally had on a black t-shirt with a dark color bottoms. But outside, he had on a black tank top. Same, same bottoms that you saw him in before? Yes, ma'am. Did you see Gary King there at the club that night? I don't remember seeing him inside, but afterwards. Okay. Where did you first remember seeing him? As he came to the front door after the shooting. Okay. So you didn't see him until after the shooting took place? Yes, ma'am. What about Michael Smith? Did you see him there that night? Yes, ma'am. Inside the club? I can't recall seeing him inside. And you saw him, where do you recall him being the first time you saw him that night? Standing to the right side of the building. Okay. And do you remember what he was wearing? A white t-shirt and red basketball shorts. A white tank top. Does anybody try to break up the fight that's occurring between Maisha and Danielle outside the club at this point? Yes, ma'am. Who was trying to do that? Myself along with some other people that was outside. Were you successful in breaking the two females up? Yes, ma'am. And what happened after, after that? We was just pretty much trying to get security to just clear the parking lot. Were you trying to leave? Yeah. Were you trying to take Danielle with you? Yes, ma'am. Where was your cousin that you were there with? Was she out there as well? I can't remember where she was at the time. After the fight broke up outside, where were you in relation to the front door of the club? To the edge of the building, towards the right. Towards, towards the oyster bar or the other side? The other side. Okay, the parking lot next to Cloud Nine? Yes, ma'am. On the side. Okay, yes, so you're more towards the side of the building? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what happens next? Um, Eugene and Quan is standing out in the parking lot, and then him and Danielle is exchanging words. Who, who, who and who are exchanging words? Quan and Danielle. Okay. And what do you hear Quan say, if you can if you can understand anything. He kept saying he was going to catch him a body. Did you see uh, Nathaniel at this point? Not at that time. When do you see Nathaniel outside the club? It was, it was a few minutes had passed and then that's when 
he came behind us. So are you standing there with Danielle? Yes, ma'am. Facing the parking lot? Yes, ma'am. And where is Quan and Michael Eugene Smith? Facing the building. Okay. So you kind of facing each other? Yes, ma'am. Where are Laquan and Michael in relation to any any cars or anything in the parking lot? Standing like between the cars that was in the parking lot, more so towards, towards the front of the vehicles. Okay. And were they standing next to any particular car that you remember? I can't remember that. Okay. Was the parking lot packed at this point? I mean, with cars, but the people were like everywhere. Okay. I, I mean, with cars. I'm sorry. <laughs> Was a car, was it full with cars? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was there also a vehicle parked kind of on the sidewalk in the front? Yes, ma'am. What kind of vehicle was that? I remember it was a dark colored vehicle. I never knew okay. what type of vehicle it was. Did you see Laquan Barrow with a firearm that night? Yes, ma'am. When's the first time you saw him with a gun? When he got it from Eugene after they passed it. Where did they pass each other? Like, not in a parking area, but in like the open spot before you actually get to the parking between the building and they have parking spots. So before the parking spots start, there was right there. So you saw Michael Eugene Smith hand Laquan Barrow a gun. What happens after that? They were just standing out there, just walking back and forth. Okay. Is this after? The, you and Danielle and Laquan and Michael are facing each other and words are being exchanged? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So they're walking back and forth. What happens next? And then eventually that's when Nathaniel came outside. Okay. What's up, nigga? Nathaniel said that? Yes, ma'am. Who did, could you tell who he was directing that to? From my understanding, he was saying it to Laquan. Did Laquan respond back to that? I can't remember. He probably was just out there, just moving around. Okay. Where was Nathaniel at this point in time when he came outside in relation to you and Dee Dee? Well, standing more so beside me and Danielle was back here. Okay. Kind of back a little bit behind the two of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And are Laquan and Michael still facing, directed to their bodies towards the front of the club? What happens next? And then Nathaniel told him, if you're going to shoot, nigga, shoot. Okay. Nathaniel says that to Laquan? Yes, ma'am. What happens? And they were just arguing back and forth, arguing back and forth. And then eventually shots started. Okay. Did you see who was shooting? Yes, ma'am. Who did you see shoot? I first seen the one that Laquan had, then when Michael leveled off and started shooting. Okay. So you saw both Laquan Barrow and Michael Eugene Smith shoot in which direction? Towards the club way. Okay. Who was standing there? Like towards it, like beside the club? Yeah. It was other people that I can see behind me and then me, Daniel, well, me, Nate, Daniel, and then Danielle was that way. <clears throat> so would you say that the three of you were closest to the two of them? Yes, ma'am. Once the two of them started shooting, what did you do? We tried to, we ducked and then ran in front of the building inside of the door. Okay. And did you see, what did you see about Nate at that point in time after the shooting started? Well, seeing him run, then fall inside the door. Okay. And where were you when you saw him fall? We was in the door together. Okay. You and Nathaniel were in the door together? Yes, ma'am. Where was Danielle? She had fell. I thought she had just tripped. Was that in the front of the club? Yes, ma'am. What happened after she fell in front of the club? Then I turned to look at her, and she was, another girl was pulling her inside of the door. Okay. Where did you get to? Like, in the door, like right in the door. Did you go in the club? Yes, ma'am. What did you do once you got inside the club? I was just sitting there, like, shocked. Did you call 911? I tried. Were you successful? Not the first time. Eventually were you? Yes, ma'am. 
Welcome back to the Long Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. So we, as I said earlier in the day, we cannot show the witness that is appearing right now that is testifying in the Laquan Barrow, Michael Smith and Gary King case, the one that's testifying right now due to safety concerns. But we can let you know what this witness is saying. So the witness has described, has identified King and Smith in the courtroom, said that uh, he saw them at the club that night. The witness says that Mr. Barrow was angry. He came out of the club making threats. The witness says that Barrow said, give me a stick, which is slang for an assault rifle. Now, the witness also says that Barrow had a shirt on, but had taken it off and it only had a tank top on. And now this is really where it's key. The witness that is testifying right now has said that he saw Laquan Barrow, Michael Smith, and Gary King each firing a gun, each firing a gun. So now we have at least one witness who's come on the stand it said that, excuse me, this is now the second witness who's come on the stand and said that Mr. King has been a shooter in this crime. I want to talk a little bit about this with Kendall Coffey, our prosecutor for the uh, second prosecutor uh, with us for the day. Kendall, um, so as I said, the witness that's testifying right now has identified Mr. King as a shooter. What is a jury to make of this when you have multiple witnesses who are each giving differing, differing accounts of what they saw and heard? Then again, it was a loud nightclub, but... Are we supposed to believe everybody? I mean, it really might be hard for them to dissect everything. Well, you know, we talk about re reasonable doubt uh, all the time. And if you've got multiple witnesses who didn't see King with, with a gun, you've got at least one witness, arguably with some bias, because it might have been a remote family member who says King was trying to be the peacemaker, then, then I, I think that uh, the case gets a lot closer uh, but it could still end up as a reasonable doubt case. And that is indeed how it's going to be argued by the defense. Meanwhile, it's going to be fascinating to see what the prosecution does. Do they want to real? sometimes when they see that they think that they've really got strong evidence against certain of the defendants, they load up on what they think is the evidence uh, that is the weakest against a particular defendant when they get to closing, because they don't want to let that third defendant uh, slip away, but that's a big tactical decision because you spend too much time talking about somebody like King because you, you think the evidence isn't quite so overwhelming. Maybe maybe Swift, Smith gets acquitted, maybe King gets acquitted. So that when you've got disparity in evidence, which we seem to have so far, it makes the prosecution's closing strategy and ultimate trial stat strategy somewhat uh, more, more complex. See, the prosecution was able to establish in my mind that three guns were fired. Okay, I believe that. If I'm sitting on the jury, I believe that. Three guns were fired. It's going to be difficult for me to think that uh, with more evidence now pointed towards Barrow, uh, some evidence now pointing towards Smith, and now new evidence kind of pointing towards King, that it would be three entirely separate individuals who have not been identified by anybody so far, that they're the shooters. And I think at the end of the day, sometimes it is common sense, but how difficult is it prosecuting this case when the actual physical evidence doesn't tie to these three men? And, or I looked at that cell phone footage. I, we're looking at fo footage from the security cameras. I mean, I'm sure maybe sure more will come out, but that footage really didn't help my understanding of what happened. So when you really just have it based upon witness testimony and your experience, can it be enough? It can be enough, but it makes it a much more difficult job because in a perfect world, if you had the better forensics and the greater clarity in, in terms of uh, firearm evidence, you could cut a couple of the witnesses loose. Uh, when you put on a lot of witnesses, of course, there's, there's more cross-examination, there's more issues and holes that can be poked in the various uh, accounts, and uh, you, you would prefer a situation where you can rely heavily upon forensic testimony, and then maybe just a couple of your very best eyewitnesses rather than put a whole batch of them, because inevitably from that collection of witnesses, questions are gonna rise, questions which the defense may use in, in, in closing argument to try to create a reasonable doubt. This case has been really interesting on multiple levels, some dramatics. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see earlier in the week, there was a witness who was, uh, this is a guy named Christopher Jones. He was incarcerated, and he was supposed to testify on behalf of the state, but chose not to. He chose not to, even in the face of a subpoena and an order from the judge. He was held in contempt of court. That was a six-month jail sentence uh, that's now on top of what he's already serving for uh, different charges. 
So he chose not to testify when he had already initially told police that Laquan Barrow was the shooter. What do you think about, the, what do you make of that? Well, I, I make of it, it's, he obviously didn't want to uh, follow up on his testimony uh, about, about Barrow. It, it's hard to know what goes on inside somebody's minds. I don't know if you remember the case, federal case some years ago, where the trainer for Barry Bonds went through a lot of efforts to make him testify against the, uh, the baseball uh, great. And that trainer ne never did testify. And he wound up spending a fair bit of time in federal prison. So it's a huge price to pay. As we can imagine, federal prison, county jail, a miserable place to be. But obviously, whether it's uh, some kind of friendship, uh, some kind of uh, other worries or pressures, we can only speculate. It takes a powerful reason to keep somebody off the stand when they got to go to jail in order to think about why they're not testifying. I know, six months in jail. I mean, this witness that we're show, what we can't show right now, it's due to safety concerns. I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong, there might be some dangers for people. I mean, we, we can't show a lot of the witnesses when they're testifying. We can play audio. There's a danger to some of these witnesses who take the stand. I mean, you have three defendants on the stand. There's probably pressure from the community. I mean, this is a, re this is a reality. It's not a TV show. This is an actual thing to be concerned about, correct? Yeah, and everybody who's in that courtroom has to go back to a community uh, and perhaps encounter or face friends of the defendants, family of the defendants. So for most of the people who are testifying, this is a very tense and frightening time. Let's show a little bit of what happened earlier in the week with Christopher Jones when he refused to take the stand, refused to testify, and even at the very beginning when he was asked, uh, do you swear to tell the truth, he said, no ma'am. Very interesting, very dramatic. Let's play that short clip for you right now. Sir, can you tell me your name? Mr. Jones, do you understand that you're under subpoena to give testimony in this proceeding? Do you receive a subpoena? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, that subpoena means that whatever you say here cannot be used against you to prosecute you for any sort of offense. Do you understand that? But it also means that you have to answer questions. And that if you were to refuse to answer questions after being given the subpoena, that you could be held in contempt of court. That's fine. And that you could be sentenced to jail. That's fine. Is that your intention? Yes. You're not going to answer anybody's questions? Not one. Jones, raise your right hand, please, again. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, tell me your full name. So that's not true? Do okay. you understand, sir, that you have been served with a subpoena requiring you to give testimony in this proceeding? Okay. Do you understand that I am now ordering you to testify in this proceeding. You don't understand that? Well, I'm telling you that you have to answer the questions of the attorneys. You're refusing. Do you understand that refusing to testify after being ordered to do so by the, a judge would subject you to a potential contempt citation? Okay. Well, it means I can sentence you to jail and without a jury for up to six months. Do you understand that? Okay. I'm ordering you to testify. Will you testify? Can you show me any reason why I should not hold you in contempt of court? Right. But you don't, you can't demonstrate any reason for me not to hold you in contempt. Of 
court finds you to be in contempt of court, you'll be sentenced to 180 days in the Marion County Jail. You're going to serve that before you return to the Department of Corrections. Well, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes I can't even make this stuff up. It's just too good to be true. Uh, again, there was Christopher Jones refusing to testify in the Laquan Barrow, Michael Smith, and Gary King case out of Florida, which we are covering here on the Law and Crime Network. Again, the witness that is currently on the stand, we're not allowed to show, we're not allowed to play any of the audio uh, due to safety concerns. It's a big issue in this case about safety. That witness that you just saw, Christopher Jones, refused to testify and was sentenced to six months in jail for contempt. Uh, why did he refuse to testify? I don't know. Was it safety? Was it a concern? Maybe. But I do want to tell you what this gentleman who is testifying right now, what he is testifying about. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, he has positively identified Laquan Barrow, Mr. Smith, and uh, Gary King as uh, each, each of them firing a gun. So each of them have been a shooter, according to this witness. Uh, he just testified that the uh, Barrow and King went to a smoke gray F-150 truck or something like that after Barrow was asking for a stick, which is slang for an assault rifle. So again, we are updating you about what this witness is testifying, even though we cannot show you the video or audio. Uh, with us today is prosecutor um, Kendall Coffey. Kendall, the, the video of Jones uh, refusing to testify, testify, have you seen anything like that? I can't remember uh, seeing anything like that. It's certainly been a very long time. Uh, people would usually rather get on the stand and say they don't remember and spend six months in, uh, in jail, which they will always remember. Right, it seemed strange. If you could have just came over and said, uh, you know, I don't remember. Then again, he did give a police interview where he positively identified Mr. Barrow. So he would have been pressured on that and ultimately would probably have had to concede about what he said. So I guess refusing to testify for whatever reason he did and whatever motivation he had was probably the best decision for him. Um, in the end, he doesn't care about spending those six months uh, in jail on top of the already charges that he has. We've seen um, all sorts of kinds of witnesses in this case. I'm curious about victims. When victims take the stand, in your opinion, how much does a defense attorney, I mean, you have to, res you have to be careful with that, correct? Because they're victims. They were shot in this case. But at the same time, when you have a victim um, like Nathaniel Kendrick, who is now pointing the finger at all three of these uh, individuals as being the shooter when he originally didn't say that, how, what's that dance you have to play as a, as a defense attorney, I guess, where you, you have to grill them on cross-examination, um, but also be respectful of the fact that they're a victim? Well, you, you just described it. You've got to grill them and respect them at the same time. Usually with a victim, what you hope you can do is focus on uh, things that they don't remember well, things that they weren't able to observe, reasons why uh, they may not actually be so very, very sure about whatever incriminating things they're saying toward your client. That That's the easiest way to cross-examine by trying to minimize a, a witness who, as you say, is as a victim, as somebody who is really hurt, is going to command tremendous sympathy. But sometimes you got to go after them. And uh, nobody likes doing that. The tone's got to be respectful, but the questions, especially to the extent that you're trying to expose inconsistencies and maybe suggesting bias or even lack of credibility on the witness, you, you got to do it sometimes. The key thing is I think defense counsel uh, try to be very, very selective. So if you got six or seven victims uh, that are going to testify, you don't try to batter every one of them. If there's somebody that you think could really, really sink your client, you kind of want to be let that be the witness that you're more aggressive about because otherwise if you are attacking every single victim aggr aggressively the jury's going to see you as sort of re-victimizing somebody who, who simply didn't deserve to be shot or hurt so the defense lawyers got to do what they got to do they want to be respectful but they want to make sure at the end of the day that they don't become a very antagonizing force in the minds of the jury. So we expect the prosecution to rest their case possibly today. Um, when they eventually do close their case and they do present a closing argument, how would you wrap it up nicely for the jury when you have these inconsistent statements, people providing different contexts, different statements than they made to police, than they are testifying now, not everyone remembers or says the same thing. Uh, you have these inconsistencies. How would you wrap it up nicely? Because you do have three defendants, and despite the fact that uh, the evidence so far seems to be stronger against Mr. Barrow than it does, let alone Mr. King and Mr. Smith, you have three defendants. You're going after each of them. 
They're all charged with second degree murder and attempted second degree murder. Uh, Mr. King, let alone as four counts, Smith and, uh, and Barrow have five, but how would you tie it up nicely so that each the finger is pointed at each three of them, each one of them, excuse me? Well, I think we'll, we'll see them emphasize the fact that there were three guns blasting away and only three defendants that can be credibly placed uh, with, with hands on the, those guns. You gotta acknowledge, of course, that there are inconsistencies because the scene was chaotic and human memory is, isn't perfect. But how many of the witnesses had a strong motive to actually lie, to actually pick up stuff? So you hope that you can address, you don't spend all your time on it, some of the inconsistencies with, with acknowledgement and say victims and witnesses are human uh, too. But just, just go back to, to the central theme. There really isn't a alternative hypothesis so far of a fourth person. We can't really identify that fourth, fourth person. There is no, to recall the movie Fugitive, a one-armed man uh, that's appeared so far in, in, in this landscape. So three guns, three defendants, three guilty verdicts. That's going to be the focus of the uh, prosecution. Kendall, we, we sit back here. We're viewing from the outside in. We don't know all the facts. We don't know what's spoken between the attorneys and their clients. Are you surprised at all, even a little bit, that the fact that at least all, not one of them has gone with um, maybe they all chose to say not guilty, that they had nothing to do with this. Are you surprised that you might not have even seen a self-defense kind of argument that perhaps, look, there was a fight. We know there was a fight. Everyone's testified that there was an altercation. There was a fight. Now, we know that a gun was brought to a fist fight. That is, a, that is an aspect there. But are you surprised that we didn't even see the flavor of a self-defense argument? I'm not completely surprised. The, the person who was uh, actually killed was a, an innocent woman. Uh, uh, no one's going to suggest that she presented a uh, imminent threat of serious bodily injury or, or death to, to any of the defendants. What surprises me a little bit is none of the three have turned on each other that we don't have, in effect, a plea deal and a cooperator. Because usually, when you're facing this much mandatory time, if for, for anybody who's, who's convicted of even attempted murder with who discharged a firearm, usually somebody doesn't want to roll the dice on, uh, on that many years and, and uh, makes a deal with the prosecution. I'm just going to have to ask, do you think at least one of them is scared uh, of doing that to the other, of testifying or at least making that deal. Uh, if you have three people who are in charge of this crime, one of them takes a deal, is there any fear there? I, I don't like to speculate, especially about things like that, but for all the reasons that you don't have your cameras on, the current witness testifying, I think that concern is in the back of minds of of at least a few people here and possibly one of, one of the defendants. Yeah, let's show some, we keep talking about the surviving victims testifying. We saw the testimony of Danielle Kendrick, Dee Dee, as she keeps her nickname is, as you keep hearing it throughout this trial. Um, she was the one of the people that got involved in this altercation with uh, Mr. Barrow's sister, Maisha Barrow. So let's listen to her testimony from yesterday. And again, as soon as we have an update in this case, we'll, test, we'll talk to you about what the witness is testifying to. And as soon as we do have a live feed, we'll make sure to go back to it. But in the meantime, here's the testimony of Danielle Kendrick. Person in at the table? Ma'am. Is he the second person in at the table in the white shirt? Yes. Okay. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Laquan Barrow. The record will so reflect. Are you familiar with a person by the name of Gary King? Just seen him on Facebook. Okay. Have you seen him in person too? Yes. Okay. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. What is he wearing? A black shirt. Can you further specify, like, what kind of tie is he wearing? Black, white, and gray. Okay. Is it a regular tie? A long tie? It's a long tie. Okay. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Gary King. The record will so reflect. Are you familiar with a person by the name of Michael Eugene Smith? No, I just, probably, I think I seen him the same night of the club. Okay. Was that the first time you would have seen him? Yes. Okay. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you describe what he's wearing? Black shirt with a small tie. Okay. Is that a bow tie? Yes. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified Mr. Smith. The record will re reflect that identification. Did you go to Cloud Nine the night of the shooting? Yes, ma'am. Who did you go with? Ebony Yomas. Anybody else with you? No. Okay. How did you get there? Ebony's car. 
Okay. Did who drove? Ebony. Do you know approximately what time you guys arrived? No, ma'am. Okay. Do you remember where you parked? No, ma'am. Okay. When you got there, was it crowded or not so crowded yet? Not so crowded. Did you get inside? Yes, ma'am. Um, what happened once you got inside the club? We walked in and I really, I don't really remember like walked in the club. Did you, when you, once you walked inside, did you see other people that you knew? Yes. Who do you remember seeing when you first got there? Ebony's niece. Ebony's niece? Yes. Is that what you said? Okay. Eventually, did you see your brother? No. Nathaniel? No, ma'am. Did you see him ever inside the club? No. Okay. No, I didn't see him inside the club. Okay. Did you see Mr. Barrow inside the club? Yes, ma'am. Did you see Mr. King inside the club? No, ma'am. Did you see Mr. Smith inside the club? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you see Maisha Barrow inside the yes, club? Yes, ma'am. Eventually, did something happen between the two of you inside the club? Yes. What happened? A fight. Okay. How did that start? She walked up to me and swung, and I swung. Okay. Did either of you make contact with each other during the fight? Did you actually hit each other? Did something break that up? Actually, no. Her brother, Quan, and I don't know. It was some other dudes, I guess, was hitting on me, Okay. should I say. Okay. So other people joined the fight that started between you and Maisha? Yes. Okay. And one of those people was Laquan, her brother? Yes, ma'am. Did, did you get hit by any of these other people that joined in on the fight? I don't know. I hit the ground. Okay. How did that all end inside the club? Eventually, did the fighting stop? Did people stop hitting each other? Yes, I guess. I don't know who grabbed me and grabbed her. They put us out at the same time. OK, so you guys ended up outside the club. Yes, ma'am. OK. Once you were outside the club, who else did you recognize was out there with you? Ebony. OK. Was Maisha out there? Yes. Was Laquan out there? Yes, ma'am. Was Mr. Smith out there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever see Mr. King that night? No, ma'am. Okay. What happened once you guys, that group, was all outside? It was argument. Between who? Me and um, Maisha and Quan. Okay. Is it fair to say the fight kind of started up again? And it was it just between the three of you, or did anybody else join in on that? Just the three of us. Okay. Did that get broken up? Yes. How? It was so many people, and I guess the bouncers. Okay. So you were physically removed from each other? Yeah. Is, that, yeah, is that a yes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what happened after that? She was still trying to get to me after the bouncer had me. Okay. Are you, when you say she, are you talking about Maisha? Maisha? Okay. What happened after that? Um, I really can't like remember like what happened right after that. I don't. Did Nate show up at some point in time outside? Yes. Okay. What was going on the first time you remember seeing him outside the club? I seen him. He said, "You gonna if you gonna shoot, nigga, shoot." Who is he saying that to? Quan. Okay. So that was your brother, Nathaniel, saying that to Laquan? Yes, ma'am. And where were you positioned in front of the club to hear that? I wasn't too far from him. From who? My brother or Quan. It was like. OK. Where were you in relation to the front door of the club? Welcome back to the Long Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. We are not able to show the witness that's taking the stand right now in the Laquan Barrow, Gary King, or Michael Smith case. However, I can update you about what this witness is testifying to, and there have been some developments. As I said earlier, this witness has positively identified all three men as shooters in this case. And uh, the latest uh, developments that we've had, and you can go on our uh, Twitter feed to see more about it, the Law and Crime Twitter feed, to see updates about this case. Uh, the witness has said 
that um, a video of police body cam footage was just shown to the jury. And it shows the witness outside of the club telling police that the defendants had taken off. Uh, he then went down to the sheriff's office. He said that um, he was shown a picture of Mr. Barrow, and he said that he was the main reason for any of that happening that night. The witness has also said that uh, Barrow fired, and boom, 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 it was very rapid. Smith started firing in front of me, and then King, again, identifying all three men as shooters. The witness was then shown photo of arrays of all three defendants. He identified and circled all three as the shooters, and now he is under cross-examination. And one of the first questions that was posed to him under cross-examination uh, is he was asked by uh, Laquan Barrow's attorney, Mr. Gorley, he asked the witness if he remembers telling police that he didn't see Mr. Barrow with a gun. The witness says he didn't see Barrow with a gun until he actually started shooting. It's going to be an interesting back and forth between the defense attorneys and this witness. I'm joined right now by Kendall Coffey, our prosecutor for the day. Kendall, big developments based upon this witness now has identified all three, including Mr. King, as a shooter. What do you think? I think it uh, sounds like the prosecution's star witness. It's why they saved him for the last day. And I think uh, the cross-examinations are going to have to be star quality, given what this uh, witness is apparently uh, saying to this jury. Yeah, we, we've just an update there is um, things are getting a little heated between the witness and Barrow's attorney. And by the way, I have to tell you, Mr. Gourley, uh, he's got an interesting style. Uh, he's, he's very, I, I like, I kind of enjoy his style. He's no nonsense, goes right into the witness, talks about it, and he has a little bit of a little bit of an attitude. I kind of like it. But the witness is reading his police statement right now. Barrow's attorney says it's much different from what he said today. And the witness says, no, it's not. I kind of see this a lot. A lot of this back and forth between what was said in a police interview, what is being said now, and then witnesses actually saying, well, what I said is not different from what I'm saying now. And I mean, it's an interesting play that you have to make. There's only so much you can ask a witness. And then for the rest, don't you just have to let the jury be the decision makers about what common sense is? Absolutely. You, you just put the statements out there, the consistencies, inconsistencies may be obvious. And if the witness wants to say, oh, yeah, they're exactly the same, then I think that just deepens the witness's credibility problems. What, what other ways would you try to attack uh, this witness? Obviously, we saw, um, and I, I want to actually get your perspective on this. When we saw the bouncer testify earlier, Wayne Counsel, the, his prior record was brought into question. It became a little bit of a testy exchange about well, how many crimes of dishonesty was he actually convicted of. Uh, how important is that for a jury? I, I don't think with that particular witness, it was a, a great big deal. He was security. He, he was a bouncer. He was simply uh, be, at being asked about what he saw and what he heard, and he seemed to have a pretty good foundation of personal knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure if he come, came across as a guy who's a spin artist. He looked, and the way he answered the questions wasn't, wasn't elaborate. It wasn't uh, eloquent or passionate. It was just, you know, sort of very direct, almost a monotone. But it, it, he looked and sound like what he was, a bouncer who was there on the scene and, and saw a lot of things. I, I was even struck by the fact that even though he was a security guard, when he saw a gun that he says was in Barrow's hand, he took off. He, he ran behind a, a car, and in a funny way, that didn't make him look like any kind of a hero, but to me, it validated to some extent his credibility. I was about to say that it showed that his truthfulness in a way. He didn't s pretend that he was a hero, didn't say he run, ran towards the gunfire. No, he, he took cover. Um, at the end of the day, this is a security job. Uh, he took a security job to throw out drunk patrons. I don't think he anticipated gunfire outside of the club. Or if he did, he was honest about what he actually did do. Um, so Kendall Coffey and I are actually talking a little bit about the developments in this case, what we saw earlier this morning. As I said, right now there is a witness on the stand who we are not allowed to show for security reasons. So I keep updating about what is happening. Um, again, we said that certain things have gotten a little heated between the defense attorney in this case, Michael Gorley, who does represent uh, Mr. Barrow, and um, the witness right now on the stand. Kendall Coffey and I are gonna keep talking about the latest developments of this case, but I do wanna continue showing you 
the testimony of Danielle Kendrick, the victim in this case, and someone who was intimately involved in this altercation. She got into a fight with Maisha Barrow, uh, Mr. Barrow's sister, and it all spun out of control. So she's a big factor in this case. And as we kept talking about all morning, the question of credibility. Do you believe this witness? Do you believe her testimony? Do you believe the testimony of her brother, Nathaniel Kendrick, who's also a victim in this case? These are the questions that the jury is going to have to consider. So I do want to play for you now, again, the continuation of Danielle Kendrick's testimony. And don't go anywhere. We'll be back here with more live analysis, coverage, and updates in this trial.